Hi, and welcome back to my Kubernetes series. In the last video, we installed Helm, the package manager for Kubernetes, and took a very brief look at the commands it supports. In this video, we will use the tool to install a network file storage provisioner, NFS provisioner for short. But what is that? Containers sometimes need to store information. As containers are ephemeral by nature, so short-lived, it makes it even more important that these containers have external storage, which would survive a crash or a restart. For example, if you have a web server, you don't want the website data to disappear only because the web server container crashes. That is where external storage comes in. The external storage makes sure that whatever happens to the container, your data will remain. If Kubernetes restarts that crashed pod up again, the data is still there and the website will resume its work as if nothing has happened. That storage is called persistent storage. The persistent storage concept is well explained on the Kubernetes website. Let's take a quick look. As you can see, there's a lot of information there. We will not go through all of these items. However, I want to highlight two things. For one, the persistent volume or PV. As per Kubernetes website, the PV is a piece of storage in the cluster that has to be provisioned by the admin or dynamically through storage classes. PVs can be NFS, iSCSI or cloud provided specific storage. The second item I would like to highlight are the PVCs or persistent volume claims. PVCs can be created in a namespace by a user and if a persistent volume aligns to what the user requests, the persistent volume will be allocated to the requester and can be used in pods and subsequently containers to save data that otherwise, if stored in a pod, would be lost in case of a crash or termination. That is enough theory for now. What will we be covering in this video? We will prepare our NFS server as well as the nodes. We will add a repo to Helm, search for the right Helm chart. We will get the values file from that chart and modify that to our needs. We will create a namespace in which we will deploy our NFS provisioner. Finally, we'll deploy that provisioner to our cluster and we will test if it's working. As there is a lot to do, let's get started with setting up our NFS server. For that, we will switch over to the terminal. The first step we have to do is to install the NFS server. To do that, we enter sudo apt install NFS kernel server and hit enter. So you can see I've already installed the latest version and don't have to wait for execution. The next step is to verify after the installation if the package will start it up automatically or if you have to do that manually. To do that, to check if the version is running, enter systemctl status nfs server. And as you can see, mine is running. Should it not run for you, just enter systemctl enable nfs server, hit enter. That will automatically enable the server. Once that's done, of course, it's denied because I'm not sudo or root user. Uh, once you enabled it, which will then make the start of the NFS server automatic upon restart, then you should start the NFS server. And I will also not have access to that as I'm not a root user. As a next step, you want to figure out where you want to store the data. Which share are you going to make visible in your network? that other machines can connect to. For me, I have provisioned some space on this file server for this share. This share sits under MNT volume 6 and in here I do have a folder 
under which I will store my production data for Kubernetes. That folder is called kubedata production. Before we continue, one important step. Make sure that the path you provide for your NFS share is owned by the user nobody, which the command on your screen makes sure of. This requirement comes from the fact that containers run services as different users and user IDs. Those IDs are being used to transmit the data across the network to your share. If the user ID of the service submitting the data does not align with the user ID who owns the share, your data will be lost and in the best case your pod will just crash. Worst case, however, you will not even notice the issue, the pod will run, but your data gets lost anyways. This is the reason you need to make sure your share path is owned by the user nobody as any incoming data will be accepted. Now that we have set the right owner for our share path, we can continue configuring the NFS server. The folder we have to go to is the Etsy folder. Let's empty the screen and in here there is a file called exports. This file we have to enter with sudo allows us to configure the shares that we provide in our network. Right after your installation all you will find in this file are the lines 1 through 10. These are examples of how you can set up your NFS shares and some of the options that you can use. Now that we're in the configuration file of the NFS server, let's go all the way to the bottom and add the share we want to provide to our Kubernetes cluster. We start with a path MNT volume 6 cube data dash prod NFS provisioner. I added a subfolder to separate out additional provisioners I intend to install going forward. NFS provisioner. Then we allow access to this share by all clients from my network with the asterisk and then we provide the options. Read write sync no sub tree check no root squash no all squash insecure. Let's go through this command step by step. As I mentioned earlier, the first part is we provide the path to the share that we want to make available. Then the asterisk, as mentioned, we provide access to every client from the network to this share. Read write describes it pretty well. Everybody or the data can be read and written. The sync option writes the data to the disk before they are applied. No subtree check prevents the check of the subfolder structure. No root squash allows to access the folder from a client as if you were the local root user. The no all squash option User IDs and group IDs are not translated to the anonymous user. This option is also the default and we could easily have omitted said option. The option insecure sounds worse than it in reality is. When providing an NFS share with a secure option, the port number from which a client requests a mount must be lower than 1024. The option insecure cancels this requirement and allows a request from a port higher than 1024. As we walk through all the options we applied to the share, a word of caution. Obviously configuring the NFS server with some of the options we used in setting up the asterisk so any client can log in carries an inherently higher risk. 
However, it is the responsibility of the Kubernetes cluster administrator to control who can request storage through role-based access control. The individual needs to ensure that not everybody who has cluster access can request storage. In my case, it doesn't matter. I'm the admin. I'm the only one with access to the cluster and in my network no one else will request storage through NFS. I can and will limit that access by limiting the IP address that can access the NFS server. In an enterprise environment, however, you might want to take additional steps to secure your storage. But that is out of scope of this video series. Now that all warnings are out of the way, let's go back into our configuration file, write in quit, and export the share so it becomes visible in our network. We do that by entering sudo exportfs-rav, and our share for the Kubernetes cluster should be visible on my network. We can test the availability of the share by entering sudo show mount e. The result is a list of shares that is provided through an NFS server. And in this list, you can see the first share is the cube data, which is the share we wanted for our Kubernetes cluster. With that, the setup of the NFS server is complete. And we can now set up the infrastructure that we need on our Kubernetes nodes. To start this process, let's exit out of our NFS server and switch over to our K8S master. All nodes of our cluster need the NFS package installed, otherwise they will not be able to process NFS mounts. So let's start this process by installing the NFS common package, sudo apt install NFS common, and we do this on the master node, yes, one, two, can see the installation goes pretty quickly and we're already done. We can now test if we can mount a share. At first let's check if we have a folder under our mount directory that we can use to mount a share. LSMNT. There is a test mount which I created earlier so we can actually use that. Let's do that. To mount an NFS share, all you have to do is sudo mount. You provide the IP address of your file server, or your NFS server rather, and then you provide the full path that you shared, which was in our case MNT volume 6 cube data dash prod slash nfs provisioner and we want that to mount under mnt test mount all right the command was executed successfully we won't have any data in there the mount was empty even if we do ls mnt test mount there's nothing in there so how can we figure out if that actually is mounted, we can use sudo mount-l for list, and then we grab everything with NFS in it. And we can see we mounted on our file server the MNT share with type 4 NFS version. That means we have successfully mounted our NFS share we exported it successfully and now we have been successfully mounting it on the K8S master. I will now go ahead and install the NFS common package on all four worker nodes, which I'm not going to show in this video, 
the command is the same sudo apt install nfs common and then that's all um, we're also going to test if i can mount the same share and once i'm done i'm going to be back for the setup of the nfs provisioner on kubernetes i'm back after installing all the nfs packages on the nodes that took me about 10 minutes so as you've seen earlier not very cumbersome or not a lot of work as we are set up with the software on the nodes we can now move on and add a repo to helm we want to start by saying helm repo add we want to call that nfs provisioner that's the name of the repository it's going to have on your system and then the address where helm can find the chart kubernetes Da dash six dot github dot io slash nfs sub dear external provisioner. Let's add that. And the NFS provisioner has been added to my repositories. Now we want to update the repositories helm repo update was successfully updated and now we can say helm search repo nfs provisioner without any additional um, additional add-ons what you're looking for you basically get all chart and all we get here is one so in this repository there is only one helm chart which is for the external storage provisioner as we discussed in the last video i created my own folder under uh, my username here under the home directory which is the k8s setup we now want to take a quick look in here. We already have two subfolders. The third one we're going to create now, mkdir, and we're going to call it 3nfs provisioner. And we're going to shorten that to not make it too complicated. We're going to enter that folder. And now we want to download the values file, the file that we have to configure to deploy that Helm chart. We do that by entering helm show values nfs provisioner slash nfs sub dear external provisioner. Oh, typo provisioner. All right, so this is the values file that you get out of that chart. And as you can see here, I don't want to just highlight and copy that. So we're going to do this command again, and we're going to export that out into the into a file and say nfs provisioner values dot yaml. That way we can then vim into that file and we can use it once we color scheme once we change that and can actually read it and then in this file here we will have to modify a few things to let the NFS provisioner know where our NFS server is, the IP address, the root of the file share, and some other details. So let's scroll all the way up in the file and let's get started modifying this configuration and deploy it in our cluster. Let's start with the easy stuff first. We scroll down a bit and we go to our server. In here, what's expected is the IP address of your NFS server. So add the IP address and let's move on to the next option. The next one is the path that you're sharing. If you remember back, we are sharing mnt slash volume six cube data prod NFS provisioner. So I'm going to take out the rest. 
Okay, for the next option, the mount options. I have to explain why I'm going to add one option in here. Later on, when we deploy Nextcloud, we will use this storage as the external storage for the Nextcloud and the, the containers that are running. I ran into issues when I deployed this option the first time because the option no lock was not in this in this uh, NFS provisioner. So once I found that out and added no lock in here, it started working and I had no more challenges when working with the NFS storage in Nextcloud. So that's why I'm adding this no lock here. You might have you might be lucky that you do not need this option because you are not deploying Nextcloud like I do later on. But for me, I need this option in here in order to make sure that the storage and the, the data that is stored from Nextcloud on the external storage is actually working. So that's why I'm adding the no lock option here. The next option is the volume name. That is the name of the folder in your file system where the NFS share will be mounted. Um, I find this name a bit too complicated. It is very explanatory. However, I want to shorten that a bit. I find that a little too long. So I'm going to call it NFS storage. Or let's say, let's keep the external storage and then remove the rest. For the next option, the reclaim policy, we need to take a closer look what this does. There are three different options for reclaim policy. Retain, recycle, delete. The default for a persistent volume is that it is being deleted once dynamically provisioned. Meaning that you, if you delete the PVC that you deployed in the cluster, your external volume will be deleted as well, which is not necessarily what you would like. Hence why that reclaim policy in this file to retain the external data is put in here. In case you delete the pod or delete the deployment, your data is still available and can be saved if necessary. So if you're developing a application, you have external data on there and you want to keep that because that data is important to set the development up in a prod cluster, you can at least save this data and that's why we're going to keep this retain policy as it sits here right now. Let's move on to the storage class. We want to create a storage class, so create true stays. That's great. The default We want that to be the default class. So we're changing that from false to true and we're going to remove false. Set a storage class name, which we want to do as well. The storage class name I want is NFS storage. We also want to provide the provisioner name manually. I don't want that to be auto-created through the system, so I want my provisioner to be called NFS provisioner. Then we have some more broad options for the storage class. For the reclaim policy, an obsolete volume is delete. I'm not going to change that because we have the archive on delete is true, which means that your existing storage will then be set to archive and it will uh, remain. So we're not going to change that. We're going to leave that pattern as well. Read write mode, um, read write once, read only many, read write many. Uh, read write once is fine, worked fine for my, for my purposes so far. Volume binding mode immediate, that's good as well. I think we should be through, not quite. We're going to take a look at our back. The role based access control, we do want to take a quick look at that. We want to create a special resource for that, so that is true. Pod security enabled false, I will leave that for now as well. However, there was a service account option, so we're going to create one, which is true, and then we have to provide a name. 
and I want that to be NFS store storage manager. Maybe a little complicated, but as soon as you take a look at all the roles in your cluster, you can easily find out what this does. That's why I'm using that kind of a uh, name. Then we're looking at resource limits, which I'm not going to update or change. And last but not least, the pod disruption budget. We'll leave that as well. As we finalize the configuration file, let's write and quit. And then we're going to create a namespace in which we're going to deploy that provisioner. If we're taking a look at the namespaces that we currently have, kubectl get ns, short for namespace, takes a little longer today. Uh, we do see that there is currently no namespace for the provisioner, so we're going to create one. kubectl create namespace nfs provisioner. Let's take another look. And we have our nfs provisioner namespace created. We are fully prepared. We have our configuration file complete. Let's, without further ado, deploy this NFS provisioner. Helm install. We're going to install the application NFS provisioner. It's a name that you provide. If you, f if you try to locate a certain installation later on, the name, that's what you provide to search for that. So NFS provisioner it is. We are looking to apply from our Helm repository, NFS provisioner, the chart NFS sub dear external provisioner. We do want that in the namespace dash N NFS provisioner. We just created that, it's still visible on the screen. And we want to additionally provide a values file with dash F and the values file was NF and had hit tab to autocomplete. Let's do it. What happens now is the container that will be deployed in our cluster will be downloaded. The values file will be applied as well as all other commands you provide. And as you can see, we are getting a NFS provisioner uh, deployed. So let's watch kubectl get all dash n NFS provisioner and take a look what happens. You see a container is creating. It's not ready yet. We want we want uh, one pod running. Currently, we have one starting up, but none is ready. So we'll wait for the container creation. You can also, if you so desire, uh, stop that watch and get some more details out of the description if you describe a pod. But as you can see, we have successfully deployed an NFS external storage provisioner into our cluster. Let's nonetheless kubectl get all dash n NFS provisioner, we can still take a quick look at the pod. So now that that's copied, kubectl describe, then we paste this and we have to also provide the namespace. Otherwise, the pod would not be found. And we would not be able to describe this pod. 
right? Let's scroll up to the command. NFS provisioner, that's the name. Uh, storage manager is the service account that um, is executing it. It's running on our K8S worker 4. You have some additional annotations, for example, the app. You can filter by that uh, annotation or the label later on. You have some more details around the pods, IP addresses and everything. You remember when we set up our pod network or rather our cluster, we defined those address ranges. You have uh, the container DID. What is the ID of the container that's running on container D? Where is it from? What chart is it? The uh, details we set the environment variables basically running in the container that we need to uh, access our NFS share. As you can see there's a lot of information that you can get out of a description. Now let's move on to the next step. I'm going to clear the screen and we're now going to test if the external storage provisioner works. To test this solution we're now starting to create two files, one for a persistent volume claim and then the other one for a container that writes something to this persistent volume that we have. So let's get started and create the persistent volume claim and I'm going to call the file test pvc for persistent volume claim and it's going to be a YAML file. Let's see if I can copy and paste my command which I'm going to make available in the description and I am. We're going to walk through this quickly but it copied or pasted everything twice so we're going to delete everything that we don't need and we're going to walk through. So we're creating the API version is one, we create a persistent volume claim, the name of the claim is test claim, the storage class name if you remember a few minutes ago we set this NFS storage class to NFS storage, that's how we address it, that's how we know what kind of storage uh, is, needs to be created by asking for the storage class. Read write once is enough for our purposes and the resources we request are 500 megabytes, maybe bytes, some 500 megabytes, whatever. All right, now that that file is done, we need to create or rather let's do something else. We're going to deploy this file right away. kubectl apply-f test pvc. Now this is going to be deployed in our cluster and we're going to take a look at that. It's going to be deployed in the default namespace so we don't need to create any, um, uh, need to create another namespace for that. So let's go and take a look at that by adding kubectl get pvc and hit enter. That's all we need. Now we will get a list of what we added here and it says pending. I was a little concerned about this pending. However, um, after investigating a little bit, turns out that I was just a little too quick. If we call this PVC again, we see that the status is bound. Um, a pending status, I had this in a previous deployment. The NFS provisioner did not work and that's why it was pending because it could not create this uh, volume claim or yeah it could not actually get a dynamic volume provisioned however it's bound meaning it was created the name you got that here as well that's how it's called we have 500 megabytes read write once through the NFS storage provisioner so we see the deployment was successful now what we're going to do is we're going to create a container and that container we will tell this container to write a file onto the storage and then we're going to navigate on our NFS server into that storage and check if the file was written. So let's go and vim test pod. I should have added YAML. I copied again my pod that I want to create and again we're going to walk through this uh, file. So First of all, you can see my uh, the colors as you've seen previously. I didn't call the file YAML, so now Vim doesn't recognize it. I'll fix that in a second here. Pod 
uh, kind pod, we want to deploy a pod, version 1, the name is a test pod, the container is called test pod as well, we're going to pull a busy box, basic container 124, uh, we can actually change this here to latest, uh, the command we're going to execute is a bin sh, so on the terminal we're going to create a file, touch, and this will be in our mount, and it should write a file called success in there. Before we move too quickly past the volumes and volume mounts, I want to take a closer look at that. Let's start at the bottom with the volumes. In each of your deployments, you declare that you want an external volume to be mounted. The external volume in this case is the is called NFS PVC, and we are referencing a persistent volume claim, the claim we just created, and this name of that claim is test claim. That's how we address Kubernetes and say, hey, you have a test claim available on your system, I want this test claim to be mine. Then if we go up to volume mounts, you're letting the system know, Kubernetes know, that you have an NFS PVC that is yours and you want to mount this external storage into the folder that you specify under mount path. Once you start the container up, Kubernetes assigns the test claim to that pod and your pod then takes this test claim and adds external storage and adds this external storage to the MNT path and that's how you work with PVCs and pods and declare an external storage to those pods. So write and quit we're going to change the file name now from test pod to test pod.yaml ls and there it is kubectl apply dash f test pvc.yaml no not pvc test pod.yaml now we probably have to be quick the container is pretty small so I'm going to try to also call the watch command without splitting my screen here now watch kubectl get all there uh, all let's see if I'm quick enough okay I am perfect All right, perfect. Our container is completed. It will now delete itself from our environment here and it will disappear in a second, I guess. So we're going to stop watching and we're now going to log in into our NFS server and see if the file was created. So what we can do is SSH with my current user into, or into my NFS server. It's the first time I log in from here, so I say yes. And now I provide my password. Once that's done, I want to approach my mount prod nfs provisioner i want to take a look we see we have a f another folder in here so let's go uh, ls and default and we see the file that we wanted to be created was successfully created. After we verified that the file was indeed created, let's exit from the server and clean up the deployment and remove all the components from our Kubernetes. So exit here, clear the screen, kubectl get all dash get all from the main 
default library it's still there so first thing we want to do is we want to delete the pod thought it was going automatically but it obviously it doesn't so we will force it out kubectl delete dash f and test pod all right we're moving removing the existing test pod kubectl get all now that is gone kubectl get pvc the pvc is still there so we also want to get rid of that kubectl delete dash f test pvc kubectl get pvc that should be gone now as well we will log in back into the NFS server and check how the NFS server behaved once we deleted the PVC. So to do that, we're just going to use our arrow up key and log back in. Navigate to the folder. If you look back into the video, we had a few uh, settings changed and one of those settings, which we d actually did not touch, said on delete, archive the existing data. And that's exactly what Kubernetes did. It applied those settings and it archived that persistent volume claim and the data within it. That means whenever you delete a persistent volume claim from your cluster, the data will be set into an archive and you can then decide or the administrator of that NFS server can decide whatever they want to do with it, can keep it for a certain amount of time and then delete it if there are no other um, rules around data retention. However, for us, we don't need this anymore. So I'm going to sudo rm-r archived and I'm going to get rid of it. After successfully deploying our NFS provisioner to our cluster, let's summarize. What is working? We now have a working cluster, including an external dynamic NFS storage provisioner. What is left to do? We will set up another storage provisioner with a block level storage, which provides faster read and write speeds in the next video. That was quite a journey and a long video. But now you can use your storage class in other deployments and request the assignment of external storage to a pod. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you in the next video.